we're going to pick up on our teaching. We're still talking about ineffective prayer versus effective prayer. Our foundation scriptures are taken from uh, the gospel according to St. Matthew, uh, verse 7 and verse 8, which read as follows. Ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone, say everyone. everyone. Say everyone. everyone. For everyone who asks, receives. That's Jesus speaking. He said, for everyone who asks, receives. That includes me. Doesn't that include you? Yeah. That inc say that. That includes me. That includes me. He says, everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. To him who knocks, it will be open. Aren't you glad for answered prayer? Let's give God a praise for answered prayer. Hallelujah. As long as I go asking and seeking and knocking, he's going to answer, he's going to open, and all that other stuff, right? That's what he just told me in his word. All right, then James chapter 5, the latter portion of verse 16 says that the effective fervent prayer, the effective fervent prayer. So now if there's effective prayer, then there's ineffective prayer. Right? If he tells us there's an, there's an effective prayer, then there is an ineffective prayer. And I want to pray effectively. Right? He said that everyone who asks receives. So if I'm not receiving, I need to see if I'm praying effectively. Right? And he says here, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman avails much. How many of you know he's talking about women too? Somebody say, uh, I heard somebody say that... Uh, there's nothing like, I can't even think of the, 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 how the phrase goes now, but talking about the power of a praying woman. You know, women know how to endure better than men do. Women know how to fight and stick to it better than men do. I'm just being real, all right? There's something about a woman who knows how to really uh, take hold of something and not let it go. Men, we, we get tired of something. It's kind of, even with our kids, right? And we get tired of our kids and we say, you know, this is just time for them to handle their business. But a mother will stay there with them and labor with them and struggle with them and wrestle with them, right? There's something about, and there's power in that. He tells us here that, in, and from the Amplified Version, it says it this way, that the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man or woman makes tremendous power available. How many of you want that power? You want the power of God to be available in your life? Amen. So that's what we're talking about. Let me, by, um, let me just do some review uh, on what we've been talking about the last few weeks so that we can move further down our prayer outline. When we talk about ineffective prayer, when we talk about prayer that misses the target, prayer that does not get the type of results that we want, the first thing we pointed out from the scriptures is that uh, that includes prayer with doubt. We've all been there, right? We prayed and you prayed for something and you ain't bit more believe God was going to answer that prayer than a man in the moon, right? Okay, and what happens is, is if, it, if he answers it, he's just trying to build us. But there comes a point in time when God expects us to grow up, and he, won't, it, he doesn't make it as easy for us. So when we pray with doubt, when we pray with unbelief, when we, when we pray with double-mindedness, anybody know what we mean by double-mindedness? Wishy-washy, right? They sing that song, sometimes up, sometimes down, sometimes level to the ground. Okay, well, the, 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 second, the second course of that, that song should have been, and so if you pray, you will get no answers. Because the scripture says that a, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let not that man think that he will receive anything from the Lord. It's a waste of time to be double-minded in prayer. Distrust, praying with distrust. You know, there are people who actually don't trust God. Now, we know that's not among us. You know, that's not among us, so, you know. But there are people who actually do not trust God, do not expect God to answer their prayers. Well, they're not, they're right, they're not going to be answered. The second category of prayers that miss the target are prayers, if I got mess, I'm messy. Let me see what kind of mess I can start today. You know, some folks get up in the morning looking for how they're going to tell folk off at work. <laughs> right? Some folk can't sleep good during the night because they plot on how they're going to get so-and-so back. 
they up half the night, right? <laughs> Trying to figure out how am I going to get so-and-so back for what, for what they said to me, okay? And then, and then try to go to God in prayer. You know, your prayer is not going to be answered. All right, prayer is with strife. I'm in, I'm in strife. You know, the Bible says that the servant of the Lord must not strive. What do we mean by strife? What do we mean when it says strife? What are we talking about when we say strife? Huh? Fighting. Fighting. Just, just contentious. Combat. All right? Well, you're not going to get prayers answered that way. Oh, and here's the big one right here. Because, you know, we have saved folk who love the Lord. You know, faithful in service. They come to every Bible study, come to every prayer meeting. You know, they're reliable. You can count on them. And they got unforgiveness in their heart. Because of something somebody did to them 16 years ago. <laughs> and, they, and, and two things are the issue with that. Number one, they don't remember what the person did. They just remember the person did something. <laughs> right? But they don't remember what the person did. Right. And then secondly... Uh, the person doesn't even know they're mad, done going on with their life, forgot all about them, nothing, and, and, and you're in bondage because of this unforgiveness. Well, the Bible tells us that our prayers would not be answered that way. Let's look at the next category. The next category of ineffective prayer is praying that self-serving. Anybody know what it is to pray a self-serving prayer? That's all about me. Me, 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 me. Me, 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 me. Now, the Bible tells us to ask, we shall receive, to seek, we shall find, to knock, the door shall be open. You know, so there is some element of, quote, of me in it, but it should not be about me. I'm the residual beneficiary of that which brings glory to God. We're like, we're like um, ho garden hoses. When you use a garden hose to take water from the, sp is it called the spigot? All right to take water from the spigot and get it to the grass or wherever you trying to get whatever you're trying to the garden all right the water and the water flows through that garden hose you know there's water that's left in that garden hose right the garden hose is the is the channel to get the water from one place to the other well see we are like a garden hose to God we cannot do for God and not end up with some residual blessing Amen. we can't do for one without ending up with some residual blessing Hallelujah. Sometimes you can go back and shake that water hose hours later and there's still water in it, right? That's how God pours out his blessing upon us. But we recognize if we think we're supposed to be the end result, the end all be all, then that's the problem. And those prayers will not be answered. But if we recognize that, we're, we're, that if our motive is to bring glory to God, then we can also understand that in the process, God's going to bless me. Amen? Why don't you thank God for that? God has creative ways of blessing you. Hallelujah. God has creative ways of doing things for his people. Yes. And then the last category are prayers uh, that where, where, where we have condemnation in our hearts. You know what I mean by condemnation in your heart? When you have condemnation in your heart, you, that's guilt. You know, I, I just don't feel worthy. I was such a bad rascal when I was out there. I'm just glad to be saved. You know, some people just, I ain't looking for God to do anything for me. I'm just glad to be saved, Right? <laughs> Some people say, I'm just glad to be in the number. No, you don't need to just be in the number. Amen. You don't want to just be in the number. God don't want you to just be in the number. If it was God's will for you just to be in the number, you'd get saved and go to heaven the next day. But because he left you here, he doesn't want you to just be in the number. He wants to use you to bring glory to him. Amen. So stop letting the devil talk to you and make you feel guilty about something that you did 16,000 years ago. And let's just go on and, and use that as a testimony of the delivering power of God. Amen. Come on, let's play, praise the Lord. So those are prayers that are ineffective. Those are prayers that are ineffective. And then, am I blocking this for anybody? Because I, I want to move this over, move my little station over some so that it doesn't block anybody's view of the screen. That might make it a little better. All right. So now let's look at the next category, which is effective prayers. We, when we talk about prayers that hit the target, we want to pray prayers that hit the target, right? We want to pray prayers that are effective. So when we talk about prayers that hit the target, first and foremost are prayers that pray the will of God. When we want the will of God to be done. Prayers that want the will of God to be done. Saints, we don't have to be afraid of the will of God. 
Religion teaches us that you got to be afraid of the will of God because you don't know what he's going to want you to do. <laughs> right? So here we are. We saved and serving God, but we scared of his will. She said, sanctify, saved, sanctify, filled with the Holy Ghost and scared of the will of God. That don't go together. Something's wrong with that picture, right? Right. Okay, so we don't have to be afraid of the will of God. When we know that God's will is what's best for me, when we believe, see, we've been trained and conditioned to think that God is out to get us. He's out to get us for, for something. Hmm. She said, because it's not what we want, so we think he's out to get us. He don't want me to have no fun. You know how you felt when she, right? The enemy, enemy talked to us and said, you know God don't want you to have no fun. He's taking away all the fun. No. God just knows how to get the best out of us. And he wants to bless, he wants to shower us with his blessing. And so the things that he instructs us to do and the things that he teaches us is, is so that he can bless us and so that he can promote us and so that he can do powerful, awesome, and great things in and through us. Amen? Amen. So we don't have to be afraid of the will of God. First John 5, 14 and 15, you don't have to turn here, but it says, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything, everybody say anything, anything. according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, then we know that we have the petitions that we have desired of him. And we talked about this. How do we know when we're praying according to the will of God? We know it when we pray his word. God did not put anything in his word that's not his will because he's not schizophrenic, <laughs> right? He's not double, he's not, uh, what, the, what uh, the double personality people. He's not, God is not bipolar. <laughs> Contrary to, contrary to popular opinion, God is not bipolar, all right? He's not that way. So his will is his word. His word is his will. You cannot separate the two. So if I'm confused about the, word, the will of God, if I don't know the will of God on this particular issue, then I go to the word and see what the word says about that particular issue, and the word will tell me what God's will is on that particular issue. And so if I lock myself up with that word, and if I, if I pray that word, and if I put that word in my heart, God will bring it to pass. Hallelujah. Every time. Come on, let's bless, let's bless God for that. Every time. Well, what happens? Sometimes we get discouraged. We give up. We quit. The enemy's talking to us and making us think it's not going to come to pass. What would have happened if Abraham had given up 24 years after the promise? He'd have missed it. So we don't know what, see, we're interested in the result, right? But God is interested in the process. Let me say that again. We're interested in the result. God is interested in the process. God is interested in the work that he's doing in us while he's taking us from point A to point B. See, there's something God's doing in us. He's building relationship with us. He's building trust in him. He's building fortitude. He's strengthening us in him. He's making us powerful when we, when we imitate and act like and look like Christ, who is our model and who came to be our example. That's what God is interested in. He's, in, he's interested in the process. He's interested in the people who will stand on his word. It doesn't matter what's going on all around them. I don't care what things look like. God's word says it's such and such, and therefore I'm committed that it is such and such. That's what God is interested in. God is... God is interested in, in, in those who will not allow the circumstances of life and the things that the enemy places in our pathway in order to disturb us and throw us off track. God is people who are going to stand on his word in spite of the enemy's attack. And so that comes through process. That comes through those trials and tribulations. That comes through pain. That comes through disappointment. That comes through having to wait. Hallelujah on the Lord. That comes through your friends walking out on you. How does that come through the, 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 the circumstances and the situations that you've depended upon and that you've trusted in falling apart? Hallelujah. That's what, when you don't have any choice and any option other than to believe God. God is interested in the process. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We're interested in the result. But when we know that God is not a man that he should lie and that God is not the son of man that he should repent, and that what he spoke, he will bring it to pass, and that what he said, he'll make it good, then I just got to learn how to wait on him. Hallelujah. I'm just going to wait on him. Look at somebody and tell them I'm waiting till my change comes. Hallelujah. Look at somebody else and tell them I'm just waiting till my change comes. 
Now, I like this illustration, too, now, because when you study that, sometimes we think, we get, sometimes we get a misconception of what it means to wait on God. Let me just deal with that for just real quickly. Sometimes we have a misconception of what it means to wait on God. Because sometimes we think to wait on God is like going up there waiting on the bus. Somebody said, well, what you doing? I'm sitting up here waiting on the bus. What you doing? Well, I'm sitting up here, girl, I'm sitting up here just waiting on God. That ain't what that means. What that means is like waiting tables. Anybody ever worked like a, as a waiter or a waitress yeah. where you're serving, right? What that act, what it means, when it talks about waiting on God, what it's actually talking about is serving him. How, it's like, you know, and, and the best servers are the ones who are very attentive to you, right? Who, who do you tip the most? The ones, who are, who, the ones who are just, they, you, they, they're just so, so friendly and so cordial, and they make sure your water doesn't run out, and they make sure your plate is hot, and they just, you know, they give you this excellent service. And so you're throwing all kind of money at them. And then you have the other one who got the nasty attitude. Right? You got the, the, the one who got the nasty attitude. You leave a nickel for that one. Right? Okay, well, see, when, it, when we're waiting on God, we're serving him. We, we're waiting on that. And because God can't help but to bless that one who is ministering to him. We got to learn how to minister to the Lord. How do we minister to the Lord? Somebody said prayer. Somebody said praise. Somebody said study. Somebody said worship. Right? Attending to him. Hallelujah. So praying the will of God. Then B, praying with confidence. Everybody say confidence. Another word for confidence is faith. And the Bible had the nerve to say, he had the audacity to say, without faith it is impossible to please him. That's a deep statement, saints. Without faith it is impossible. Now what does impossible mean? <laughs> impossible means it ain't possible, right? So you mean to tell me I can go to church every Sunday. I can sing in the choir. And the Sundays that I don't sing, I can usher on the usher board. Right? Somebody say, talk about me. <laughs> <laughs> I can go to every Bible study they have in the city during the week. Some of y'all go to every Bible study. Monday, you're in this Bible study. Tuesday, you're that Bible study. Wednesday, you're that. You know, I can do all of those things. But if I'm not operating in faith, even though I'm doing all those things, it don't mean a hill of beans. Because without faith, there ain't no other way. Because we said impossible, right? And what y'all tell me impossible mean? I can't find another way. Ain't no way around this one. He said without faith, it is impossible to please him. But thank God he don't leave us destitute. Because he showed us how to get faith. The Bible says faith comes by hearing. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And hearing by the word of God. If you don't have enough faith in a certain area, get into the word of God. Hallelujah. Because it will build up your faith. Come on, let's bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's bless the Lord. So praying with confidence and expecting results. If I pray with confidence, I'm expecting results. How many of you pray something and you don't expect God to do it? I'm going to go ahead and pray this thing, but I don't expect God to do it. Why are you wasting your time? <laughs> why are you wasting your time? And why, why are you coming up in the prayer line saying, Pastor, pray for me, such and such and such and such, and then you leave thinking he ain't going to do it? <laughs> well, what are we praying for? Huh? What, 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 why are we praying if we ain't expecting God to do it? Pray with confidence. Everybody say confidence. confidence. Pray with confidence and expect results. Now, that requires me to be stable because some, some, some things manifest. I love that song, Manifest the Choir Sings. Y'all see, I always run around like crazy when they start singing that one because it means so much to me. But uh, see, Nana got off track and I can't even remember what I was going to say. Y'all pray for me. Pray for me. Pray right now for me. Amen. And pray an effective prayer for me. Glory to God. But we expect results. We pray prayer, and if we pray the prayers according to the word of God, and we stand on the word of God, it, the process, that's where I was to see y'all have, y'all had just prayed an effective prayer. The process, while I'm going through the process, I'm still believing God. 
Joseph. The Bible talks about Joseph. God gave Joseph a vision, right? Joseph was about 18 years old at the time. Before he knew it, his brothers were selling him into slavery. Now, Joseph could have been in that pit because the Bible says they, they, first they were going to kill him, and one of them talked to him, don't kill him, y'all, because his daddy going to get me if y'all kill him, so let's not kill him. And so they, they, they threw him in a pit until they could find somebody to sell him to. And so while Joseph is in the pit, see, if that had been some of us, we'd have been throwing hissy fits. I've been faithful to God, and look what he did to me. Why you do that to me, God? And all that kind of thing. But Joseph didn't do that. And the Bible said, and this, I, I love it when I read that story because it's so phenomenal to me. The Bible says that even when Joseph was in slavery, the Lord was with Joseph. Now, when you're looking at that, how, that, how the Lord with me? And I mean, I got sold into slavery. That don't look like the Lord is with me. Right? But the Bible said, hallelujah, the Lord was with Joseph. And so even though things might, between the time that God gave you the promise and the time that the promise manifests, even though things are going contrary to that, and even though it does not appear that it's coming to pass, and even though everything is topsy-turvy and upside down, the Lord is still with you, hallelujah. And you've got to believe that God is with me, that God cannot lie, and it shall come to pass. You got, Walter Hawkins said it best. Don't wait till the battle is over. See, we want to wait till the battle is over. Don't wait till the battle is over. Shout now. If you believe the word of God, if you believe that he's doing what he said, if you believe that he cannot lie, you don't have to wait till it manifests to start shouting. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let, if you say, well, I don't want them to look at me. Let them look. Let them keep on looking when the blessing manifests. Hallelujah. Pray with confidence. Expect results. Hallelujah. I'm trying to move on, y'all. Let us see. Let us see when we talk about effective prayer. If I say effective prayer, we're talking about prayer that hits the target, right? This is prayer that recognizes a place of righteousness in God. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. Because this is the part they don't like. Help me, Lord. Put us. Put a fence around me, Jesus. <laughs> We've got all this grace teaching that causes us to believe that we don't have to do anything right. We don't have to obey God. We could just be all going to heaven. No matter how we act, no matter what we do. That devil is a liar. That devil is a liar. That devil is a liar. The Bible, Jesus said there's many who are going to walk up to me one day and say, Lord, Lord, look at all this stuff I've done in your name. And he's going to turn around and look at him and say, depart from me, you that work iniquity. We've got to walk upright before God. None of us is perfect. But we've got to do the best we can do. We cannot make excuses for our sin. We cannot get up in the morning and do a deliberate sin. Now, you all know I'm an attorney. There's a difference between an accidental murder. It may be manslaughter, depending upon, quote, unquote, how accidental it is. But there's a difference between that and a premeditated, deliberate murder. That's murder one. There's a difference. And so when I wake up in the morning and I'm plotting on my sin, that ain't, ain't, grace ain't for that. The Bible says, shall I continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. The scripture says, oh, no, that's not how this thing works. Grace is there to cover me when I fall into sin. I didn't see this thing coming, and next thing I knew, I was down. That's what grace is for. Grace is not here for me. Well, let me just do everything I'm big enough and bad enough to do. That devil is a liar. We've got to walk up right before God. Hallelujah. And we thank God that when we fall, there is an advocate. Hallelujah. Who's standing right at the right hand of the Father, pleading our cause on our behalf. But we got to do what's right. Amen. So effective prayer recognizes the place of walking up. Again, we're not talking about perfection, but I ought to be doing better today than I was doing yesterday. If I'm still the same at the same spot now that I was 55 years ago, there is an issue. And it is a major issue. Amen. 
Let me get off of that so we can get our people back now. Amen. We, we want y'all to come back with me because y'all left the building. Amen. Some of y'all left the building on that. Letter D, effective prayer makes the promise of God the foundation of all prayer. It makes the promise of God the foundation of all prayer. Do you know that you, that's an anchor. How does an anchor operate? Huh? Keep the grounded. What'd you say? Holds it down. What'd you say? Stabilizes it. Right? Because remember, we talked about how when it's not stable, when it's wishy-washy, it doesn't get respond, a response. So an anchor holds it in place. The, notice, the anchor doesn't affect the waves or the wind or everything that's buffeting against it. It just holds it in place in the midst of the storm. And that's the word of God. The word of God is our anchor. Yeah. Hallelujah. So that when everything that's buffeting up against us and trying to knock us off track and trying to get us to give up and trying to get us to quit is coming against us, we look to the word of God and we recognize that he cannot lie. Hallelujah. Lord, you can't lie. I thank God you cannot lie. So even though I'm in the midst of this storm, you can't lie. And so you're going to bring me through to the other side. Jesus told the disciples, get into the ship and I'm going to meet y'all on the other side. They got down there in the middle of the lake and here come the storm. Hallelujah. Here come the storm. Peter saw him walking on the water. They thought it was a goat. Hallelujah. Peter said, Lord, if that's you, can I come out there with you? Because I don't want to be on this boat no more. This boat is... <laughs> and so the Bible says, Jesus said, well, come on. And when Peter stepped out that boat, the Bible says he was walking on the water. Did y'all believe the word of God? But then what happened? Somebody said, well, he took his eyes off the Lord. What did he start looking at? He started looking at the circumstances. He's looking at the weight. Oh, this windy out here. Oh, it's the, you, the, the, it's the, the, this storm, the, this, these waves are getting harder. Now, wait a minute. If the, whether the waves were high or whether the waves wasn't high, you can't walk on water unless the Lord is doing something in there. So how are the circumstances going to knock you off track when it took the Lord to get you on track in the first place? Hallelujah. When we, we recognize it takes God to do it. Hallelujah. If we could do it of our own volition... Somebody said we wouldn't need God. I need him anyway. But I understand the point. I understand the point. Many of us would not rely upon him. And so God creates situations and allows us to, to incur and experience situations where we got to believe him. Hallelujah. You know, everything else is lost. There's no other way. There's no other hope except you and you alone. And then what we have to do, we have to turn around and do what he created us to do, which is to give glory to him in the process. Hallelujah. God has created us for his, he's got a by any means necessary plan. All right. We're going we gonna to glorify him one way or another. But he intends to be glorified. Let me move on. Amen. All right. So, those, you know, we talked about ineffective prayer versus effective prayer. And so I started talking about the outline or the template. The outline or the template for effective prayer. Because if you remember, there was a time, or you may not remember, let me just recount this, where the disciples went to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. We see everybody else running around here, and they clicks praying. So how do you do this thing? And so he says, well, after this manner. Jesus said that, right? Mm -hmm. After this manner, pray you. Now, what does it mean, that phrase, after this manner? What does that mean? Follow, Follow this example. Follow this example. He says, after this man, I pray you. The first thing that he said is, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. <laughs> you, know, you, can, you, know, if, you know you can get down on your knees or stand up or lay down or pray however you pray, drive down the street, and you can spend all day long just talking, just hallowing his name. Yeah. Hallelujah. He says, pray, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So the first thing that he teaches us in this is that we, we, we recognize who he is. He is not just some God who's up there, out there somewhere, but we've got a relationship with him. You know it means all the things, it means everything in the world to have a relationship. Doesn't it mean everything? Hallelujah. Now, you, 
they got pictures, and, and I'm sure we, we even have pictures today, but I, I remember pictures of JFK when he was president. And they got this famous picture that, they, that you can find on the internet with his son playing under the desk. Now, he's in there doing uh, international business, right, representing this country. And everybody doesn't have access to him. But what, what, what they call John Jr.? What did they call him? John John? John John, you got a picture. John John under, at his daddy's feet, under the desk, playing. I was not worried about nothing, she said. Our father, that's my father, hallelujah. Uh, he, somebody said, well, see, he's so big, he created the world, and he's yet my father, <laughs> hallelujah. hallelujah. He's got all this stuff he's attending to, and he's yet my daddy. We've got to recognize the relationship that we have with him. You have a relationship with him. That gives you entitlements and access that everybody don't have. How many of you know you got a relationship with him? Hallelujah. How many of you know you have a meaningful relationship with him so much that you can call him daddy? Everybody can't call Obama daddy, right? Everybody can't call, her, call him daddy. Hallelujah. Everybody, you know, but you got a relationship with him. That's daddy. So Jesus said, recognize, first of all, that not only is he some God out there, some big God out there, but he's daddy. So he's changing our, our perspective on who he is. Then he says, hallow his name. That word hallow means make it holy. Recognize the holiness in it, right? That word hallow, it means recognize the holiness that's in his name. Now, see, the problem that many of us have is we don't know his name. We know Jesus, but that's about the extent of what we know. So what I want to do today for the rest of the day, I want to talk about some of his names so we can talk about what it means to hallow his name. All right. Let's look at some of the names that the Bible identifies. Because what we when you study particularly the Old Testament, what you find is that when the people had a situation, when the people had a need, when the people had a problem, that God would show up at that time and reveal himself by name as the solution to that problem. So when we recognize, and, and in prayer, when we recognize his name, we see, well, his name means healing. So if I'm sick in my body, his name means healing. So if I'm hallowing his name as my healer, that, that's part and parcel to believe in him for healing. Amen? Let's look at some of the names. The first one I want to look at is Elohim. Everybody say Elohim. Elohim is God the creator. Elohim is God the creator. Elohim means life giver. When you go through Genesis chapter 1 and God introduces himself to us, that's Elohim. The Bible says, in the beginning, Elohim created the heaven and the earth. All right? That is creator. Everybody say Elohim. Elohim, Elohim is God the creator. It means life giver. How many of you know God is the giver of life? God is the giver of life. God is the one who created all things. And creation means that you start with nothing. You start from scratch. Um, a builder or a maker starts with something. A carpenter, for example. You start with something. You got wood. You got nails. You got a hammer. But a creator starts with nothing. God started with Nothing tangible, we should say, because he did have something. And what was the something that he had? His word. The Bible says he created all things by his word. And without his word, does not anything exist that exists. How did you think that? You, you, he said nothing exists that exists did not, that does not. You can't trace it back to his word. So everything that you can look at, everything that you can touch, hallelujah, glory to God, we can trace it all back to the word of God. Everybody say Elohim. Elohim. Let's go to the next one. The next one is El Shaddai. Say that with me, El Shaddai. Say that, El Shaddai. El Shaddai means the almighty God. Hallelujah. El Shaddai means the source. Do you know what? The state of California is not your source. AT&T is not your source. 
General Electric and whoever it is that you draw your paycheck from. That is not your source. That is a temporary agent that God is using to provide for you. But that's not your source. And when you understand that God is my source, when I understand that El Shaddai is my source, if they hand me a pink slip, I don't have to fret. I don't have to fall out and have, a, and have some type of Holy Ghost fit. Because what one door closes, God is there to open up another one. God is my source. Hallelujah. El Shaddai means sword. Everybody say, he's my sword. So don't you sit up and worry about what they're doing and who's getting laid off and who's getting fired and what you, whether you standing up to muster. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff because God is your source. Hallelujah. And the Bible says the cattle on a thousand hills belong to him. He said all the silver is mine, all the gold is mine. Glory to God. And so if they close the door, God can walk you through another door. God is my source. El Shaddai means the nourisher, the one from whom I gain nourishment. So not what he's depicting is a mother, for example, not a mother, because it also means the breasted one, the provider of nourishment for me. That's what El Shaddai means. It means the nurse. What's a nurse? An attendant, right? Somebody who brings me back to hell. El Shaddai means the, oh, I love this, glory to God. El, you know how they say he, 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 he bad all by himself? This is where they get that from. The all-sufficient one. God is so bad that he is the only being, God is the only being that doesn't need anything outside of himself to exist. Hallelujah. Some of us, we think we big and we bad, but you need air, you need food, you know what I'm saying? You need all types of things. But God doesn't need anything that's not on the inside of him already. Hallelujah. He is the self-existent, all-sufficient one. And then I like this one. It means the God who is more than enough. Whatever enough is, hallelujah. God said, I'm more than that. I, whatever. You say, well, Lord, this is enough right here. I, I just need you to do this right here. God said, let me show you who I am. I'm more than enough. Come on and bless the Lord. He's there on Shaddai. Come on and praise him, saints. Glory to God. Now, there are scripture references here. I'm not going to go to the scripture references. You can write them down and you can, you know, do some self-study and go to those scripture references. But where you see these, these names come up. We've got them translated in our English Bibles as God or whatever, all right? But the, when, you go, when, you, when you trace it back to the Hebrew, in, this, in Genesis 17 and 1 and in Exodus 6 and 3, for example, the, word is actually, the name is actually El Shaddai. All right. The next one. Everybody say Yahweh. Yahweh. Say that with me, Yahweh. Yahweh. Now, some of you like to say Jehovah, yeah. all right? So it's, it's, it comes from the same derivation. Let me just explain to you, let me give you a little bit of background on this. Jehovah, well, let me, let me step back even a little bit further. In the Bible, the commandment is, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, right? Now, the Jews took that so literal that when they were writing out the Bible, the original scribes, as they were writing out the Bible, whenever they came to his name, they left out the vowels. Okay? Because they didn't want anything to look like they might possibly be doing something with his name. So they stayed as far away from it as possible. So they took out the, vo they took out the vowels. So when you, when you go to the original manuscripts, his name doesn't have vowels in it. Now, so that's where, so the name has a Y, an H, a W, and an H in it. And so across time history, people inserted the A and the E to say, well, we believe that's Yahweh, because we really don't know, to be honest with you. We really don't know what the vowels are, because they were never, they were never recorded. Now you say, well, how does that turn into Jehovah? Well, when the Bible was translated by the Germans, it was translated by the Germans before it was translated into English. The Germans took a Y and changed it to a J. There were still no vowels. So the Jehovah, and in, in, in Hebrew, W, is a, it sounds like a V, V. All right? And so the Germans said Jehovah, and they added a couple extra vowels. Now, Hebrew doesn't have J's. So the J came from the German translation, and we adapted the German translation. 
which is why we sometimes say Jehovah. All right? Just to give you that understanding. But Yahweh means the external self exist the eternal self-existent God, the God who is from everlasting ha, to everlasting, the one who said before there was a beginning, there was God. <laughs> and, and, and you can't never count the end to him. There's going to be end to heaven and earth, but there's not going to be an end to God because he's eternal, he's everlasting, and he's self-existing. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So he, he, he existed before the world was. Before the beginning was, there was God. Our English translations say, in the beginning, God created. It's actually before the beginning was God. God existed before the beginning, and that's Yahweh. It also means the ever-revealing God of covenant. Everybody say covenant. covenant. Yahweh is the name through which he, from time to time throughout the Old Testament, revealed himself to his people. And now let's get into some of these Yahwehs. All right. The first one I want to look at is Yahweh to sit canoe. Everybody say Yahweh to sit canoe. There's going to be a test on this next week. <laughs> we might give out a prize for somebody who knows them. Everybody say Yahweh to sit canoe. Yahweh to sit canoe means the Lord our righteousness. Hallelujah. Yahweh to sit canoe means the Lord our righteousness. Now, of our own volition, the Bible says that my righteousness is as what? Filthy rags. So when I get full of myself and I think I'm all that, the very best that I have to offer of my own volition, even though I think I'm all that, right? You know how they say some folk think they stuff don't stink? Well, you and your unstinking stuff, the Bible says, is as filthy rags to him. The very best that I have. All right. So the Bible tells us that he imputed righteousness upon us. Now, how many accounts we have in here? Any accountants? All right. He imputed a couple of accounts. He imputed righteousness. Now, I learned this accounting term, um, imputation, when I took accounting. Didn't learn anything else in accounting, but I do remember that. <laughs> I don't have anything else. I, I took two years of accounting. Don't know anything else from that class. Well, I know a couple things, but just a couple. And one of them is this. This concept of imputation, what I learned is that in accounting, especially back then, not computers are used for everything, but back in the day when you had to do it by hand, um, you had things in your credit column, right? You had things in your, in your debit column, and sometimes you just couldn't get them to balance. And it's off by $1.95. And I done traced through all these receipts, and I've tried to trace in my mind what stores I went to, but I can't find this $1.95. So what I learned in accounting class is that you can create a $1.95, <laughs> just invent one, and put it in the other column so that it, so that it balances. That concept is imputation. And the Bible says that he imputed right. So even though my righteousness is as filthy rags, God put, created an entry called Jesus Christ, hallelujah, and put him in the other column Amen. and imputed righteousness upon me. Isn't that wonderful? Come on and bless the Lord. So that when, we, when God sees us, he doesn't see you now as filthy rags as long as you are walking in Christ. He don't see all the nasty, messy stuff that the devil tries to use in order to get you into condemnation. God has forgotten all about that stuff, kicked it to the curb, cast it into the sea of forgetfulness, remembers it no more. And what he does is he sees Christ in you, the hope of glory. Come on and bless the Lord. Hallelujah. And it's because of that righteousness. It's because of God's view of that righteousness in me. That's what gives me access to him. See, in unrighteousness, I don't have access to him. You remember in the Old Testament, there was a time that God had called the people up to the mountain, but he said, don't let the people get too close. And he told, he told Moses, you better have them folks set up stanchions. You see what this is? This is a stanchion. And he told Moses, have them set up, set up stanchions around the base of the mountain because if somebody gets too close, up, they're going to be consumed. Why? Because they're not righteous, because they're not holy. And so what he's done in Jesus Christ is he's imputed righteousness upon us. And that means 
that he's taken down the stanchions and he gives me access to this side of the auditorium. Come on and put your hands together and give God praise. Hallelujah. The Lord is our righteousness. And so the devil can't condemn you. The Bible says there is therefore not condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So the devil trying to get you, well, I can't do this and I can't do this and God ain't going to hear me. Shake that devil off of your back. Tell him, get thee behind me, Satan. I know who I am in Christ. Hallelujah. The Lord is our righteousness. It's not, it's not about me. So when the devil start talking to you, just say, it ain't, even, it ain't mine no way. <laughs> I'm walking in his righteousness. Glory to God. And if God saw fit to give me his righteousness, why shouldn't I wear it? Hallelujah. If he thought enough about me to give me his righteousness, I need to wear it. So when the devil starts talking to me about stuff, I just start flagging my righteous flag in front of him. <laughs> I'm righteousness in him. Hallelujah. Look at somebody and tell them I'm righteous in him. And it's the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. It's the righteousness of God. So that's Yahweh to Sid Canoe. So when the devil tries to condemn you, Jesus said, hallow his name. I thank you that you are my righteousness. Lord, I thank you that you are my righteousness. Lord, I recognize that if it was just left up to me, it would be filthy rags. But I thank you that it's not up to me because this is, a, this is an exercise that you've done. You've declared me as righteous. And that's why I have act. That's why we can come boldly. Somebody say boldly. boldly. Before the throne of grace to obtain mercy and to find grace to help in the time of need. The reason I can come boldly is because I'm clothed in his righteousness. How to see, back in the day, they didn't have access to him, remember? Only one person could go into the Holy of Holies. Only one person had access to him, and that was just one time a year. And they learned after a few mistakes. <laughs> they learned after a few mistakes to tie a little rope around his leg. And it had a bell on it. And so if he didn't do what he was supposed to do, he wasn't clean like he was supposed to be clean. We're talking about the high priest, right? If he, if, he, if, he didn't, if he wasn't holy, if he wasn't clean, if he didn't do the right sacrifices for himself, you would hear something jingle. Right? You'd hear some jingle. Y'all talk about jingle bells. That started way before this Christmas. <laughs> you would hear something jingle. And you'd be listening, and a few, if, a few seconds later, if it started jingling, you knew he was okay. All right, he's all right. But, but if you hear something jingling, you sit there for an hour, and it's still, it stopped jingling after an hour, just start pulling the rope out. <laughs> but the Lord is our righteousness. Hallelujah. Don't you thank God for that? Amen. Amen. Let's go to the next one. The next one we want to talk about is Yahweh Makedesh. Say that with me. Yahweh, Yahweh. Makedesh. Yahweh Makedesh. That's the Lord, our sanctifier. Now, I grew up in church, and they taught me in church that sanctification was, you know, she had to wear, she couldn't wear red. Because if she wore red, she was a Jezebel. So back in the day, there'd be a whole bunch of Jezebels in here. I'm just, I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. They said that she had to wear her collars all the way up here, yeah. right? She couldn't wear long sleeve. Uh, y'all went through. Y'all, yeah. <laughs> yeah. if anybody ought to be rejoicing in the livery that, that Christ has set us free, it needs to be a woman. <laughs> she had to wear her collars way up here. She had to wear long sleeve. If she did any of that differently, if she wore her dresses too high or whatever, didn't wear them down to her ankles, you know, then she wasn't sanctified. To them, sanctified was an outward appearance. That's what they taught, and some of them still teaching that today. Yeah. But when you study the scripture, you come to find out that you can dress a certain way, you can look a certain way, you can act a certain way, and it can look sanctified to me. Yeah. Yeah. It can look the part. Yeah. How, many of you, how many of you know stuff can look the part and not be the part? Yeah. Sanctification is a work not that you do, it's a work that he does. And what I learned about sanctification is that sanctification, it means to separate and to separate it as holy. So I talk about this all the time with, you know, you ladies who have your expensive jewelry. You don't keep your expensive, precious jewels with your everyday stuff. 
your precious, expensive heirloom stuff, you take care of that. The everyday stuff, I don't know where that thing is. <laughs> I lost that thing three weeks ago. I don't know where it is. Somebody call you up and ask if they can borrow. I don't know where that thing is. Right? You don't really care about that. But the stuff that's significant, that's important, you have a special place for that. You keep it locked up and, you know what I mean? You, you, you have places for that. You make sure that it's polished well. You don't let it get tangled. Some of your jerseys, it's so tangled up, it takes you three days to get it loose. <laughs> but that stuff that's important to you, you don't let that get tangled, right? That's because you've sanctified it. God has sanctified you. Hallelujah. You ain't of the world. You ain't like them. God sees you as significant and important to him. You are precious to him. Hallelujah. You mean something to You mean little old me means something to him? Yes, little old you. With all that I've done, with all that I've done, hallelujah, I still mean something to him. That's worth shouting and running around this room right now. Hallelujah. He is Yahweh Makedesh. He's the Lord who has sanctified you. He has set you up. You are significant. You are precious to him. You are most important to him. You mean something to God. Point to yourself and say, I mean something to him. It doesn't matter how other people, other people might not even know you exist. Other people might not. You, know, you have some people, they won't look at you. They won't talk to you. They act like you don't mean anything. They act like you're nothing and a nobody. But that's not God. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter. Other people can look down their nose and snub their nose at you and pretend like you don't exist all they want to. But even though I don't exist to you, I mean something to God. I'm precious to him. I'm significant to him. I'm important to him. I am his favorite. Point to yourself and say, I'm his favorite. Because he has sanctified me. Hallelujah. He has sanctified you. Set you apart. But now what he said is because I have sanctified you, now I want you to do something. I want you to sanctify yourself. I want you to be ye holy. Because that word makedish, it also means holy. He says, be ye holy as I, the Lord your God, am holy. If you're sanctified, you don't act like stuff that ain't sanctified. Stop walking around acting like something that ain't sanctified. Stop walking around acting like something that hasn't been redeemed, hasn't been set free, hasn't been rescued. Walk and talk and act like you are. Hallelujah. You are a king. You are a queen. You know, kings and queens don't act like everyday people. You can dress them like everyday people, but something about the way they hold their head up, something about the way that they sit in the chair, Something about the way that they answer your questions. You know that they are different. Hallelujah. Glory. You know there's something different about that person. And that's the way it is with you. When you go to work, even though you have to wear your work uniform, the people ought to know there's something different about her. Hallelujah. There's something different about him. They don't talk like we talk. They don't walk like we walk. Now, we're trying to fit in. I just need to fit in. No, you don't need to fit in. You need to glorify him. Amen. Hallelujah. The Bible says you are the salt of the earth. What is salt? Jesus gave us the explanation, didn't he? What is salt? What's the purpose of salt? A purifier. A preserver. Right? He said you are the salt of the earth. The reason the world is still here because of you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The, them folks talking about laying you off, they better keep you. The reason why that company is still there is because you're there. You are the preserving agent. They, they mess around and lay you off, they, the whole company might fall apart. You are the salt of the earth. He said you are the light of the world. That's you. Punch yourself and say that's me. So the light can't act like darkness. He said you don't take a light and put it under the bed. Some of y'all, we don't want nobody to know I'm, I don't want nobody to know I'm saved. You better let them know you're saved. <laughs> you're the light, he said, of the world. Aren't you glad you're sanctified? Come on and bless the Lord that you're sanctified. Hallelujah. Let's look at the next one. We can get through one more. Yahweh Shalom. Now, y'all know what this means. If we don't know anything else, we know what Shalom means. Yahweh Shalom. Everybody say that with Yahweh Shalom. Shalom. The Lord is my peace. Hallelujah. Come on, the Lord our peace. The Bible says he will keep you in perfect peace. There's a condition behind that. 
whose mind is stayed on him. When you find yourself, I'm bent out of shape, pulling your hair out, throwing fits, nervous, breaking out in hives. The solution is to take my mind and shift it to him. He said one of my favorite scriptures. Y'all hear me quote this all the time. People ask me my favorite scripture. This is the one I'm quoting at the time. He said, be careful for what? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> but, Lord, this is big. Be careful. And what's that word? And careful, he means anxious, right? Mm -hmm. He means tripping. Right. And what other way we can put it? Don't be tripping on nothing. Mm -hmm. I said that double negative. I got to fix that. <laughs> Don't trip about anything. <laughs> he said, be careful for nothing. What does nothing mean? So what's big enough to offset the word nothing? But see, he don't understand what I'm going through. If you knew what I was going through, maybe you would rewrite that scripture, Jesus. Be careful for nothing. And nothing means not a thing. Because he said, I got you. Look at somebody saying, he got me. He got me. He said, you don't have to be careful for anything. You don't have to be running around pulling out your hair about stuff. You don't have to be throwing hissy fits. You don't have to be taking a week off of work. <laughs> he said, but in everything, by prayer and supplication. When I, so when I get tempted to start worrying, when I get tempted to start fretting, when I get tempted to start tripping, you know how some of y'all be tripping. Don't, don't sit up here and try to look holy. <laughs> Even though we told you to be holy, right? We just got finished telling you to be holy. Now we're going to tell you, don't be sitting up and trying to be holy. You know you be tripping. <laughs> he said everything by prayer. Whatever it is that I feel, I see it coming, right? I, see, I feel a fit coming. He said prayer. I feel a trip coming. He said prayer. I feel a, you know, I'm about to lose it. He said prayer. And he said everything. And look what he says here. He says everything by prayer and supplication with what? Thanksgiving. Why, do we, why does he tell us to do with Thanksgiving? Why Thanksgiving? In all things, give thanks. Why can we give thanks in the midst of tragedy? What's wrong with God that he would want me to give thanks in the midst of a whole bunch of mess? What is wrong with him? Don't he realize what's going on? Now, I thought he sent Jesus down here so he could identify with me. Since Jesus came down, he ought to see that I, 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 I got to have a right to trip on some stuff. <laughs> he said everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Why? With thanksgiving, I'm thanking God that he, that he got me. Amen. Hallelujah. Ahead of time. We talked about Edwin Hawkins earlier or Walter Hawkins. Don't wait till the battle is over. Lord, I thank you. You got this. I thank you. You got this. I thank you, Lord, for giving me peace. He says, everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. He said, you do that and the peace of God. That passes all understanding. People are going to be looking at you saying, now she know I'm just waiting for her to have the breakdown. <laughs> right? People say, I'm just, any minute now, just let's watch. She, she got to be ready to have a breakdown. And you shouting and rejoicing in God because he got you walking in perfect peace. Hallelujah. He said, the peace of God that doesn't make any sense to anybody will keep your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. And he said, let me tell you something else. See, Paul, it got good to him then. He said, I ain't even through with this yet. He said, finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, 
whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, and whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. The devil wants you to think about everything that's negative, everything that's bad, everything that's going wrong, everything the people are saying. God said, take your mind off of that stuff and think about me. Think about my goodness. Think about my word. Think about how I'm a very present help in trouble. Think about how I'm a deliverer. Think about how I'm a way maker. Think about what I've done for you in the past. Think about the miracles that I've worked on your behalf. Think about the fact that I'm bringing you out right now. Think about the fact that you haven't lost your mind. Think about the fact that they haven't taken your house. Think about the fact that if they did take your house, I still got you. Hallelujah. Keep your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm going to stop before they put the sign up. I can sign happy. I can sign happy, y'all. Let's give God a praise. Hallelujah for his word. Yahweh Shalom. We're talking about ineffective prayer versus effective prayer. Any questions before we conclude? Well, let's just give God a praise. Hallelujah. Let's just give God a praise. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for understanding of your word. Hallelujah. We thank you for how much you love us, oh God. We thank you for how much you care about us. We thank you for how you look on our state. I thank you, oh God. We thank you that even though we are individuals, in the midst of these masses of individuals, that we mean something to you as individuals. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know the Bible, I'm not going to start up all over again, but I got to say this. You know the Bible says that even the hairs of your head are all numbered. And I hear from people say, well, he, know the, he knows the... He knows the number of hairs on my head. It's more than that. It's not only that he knows the number of hairs on your head, and if you build, he has to go to your, your, your teeth. <laughs> you got to go to your, you, you know. But not only is he saying that he knows the number of hair, he's saying that each one has an individual identity. Hallelujah. That's number three. That's number 42. That's number 1065. He says they're all numbered. They all have an individual number. That's how well he knows you, and that's how much he loves you. Come on, let's stand to our feet and give God praise. Hallelujah, you're worthy, God.